All right, welcome into episode five. We have our co-host Zachary Ellis, and we have our ever popular Riley Clark. Co-co-host. <laughs> co co-co-host. <laughs> Assistant to the co-host. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> All right, we have a lot of stuff that we want to talk about, but we are going to do it in a exciting fashion. Riley, we like to start with a kind of religious background. What was, you know, growing up in the church in California for you? What was that like for you? It's definitely a lot different than up here at Utah State. <laughs> yeah. I think I hung out with two friends that were members of the church, and both of those two we're partiers. I'll just keep it at that. <laughs> so it was definitely a lot different experience, but that also made it so there was a lot more chance to stand out, I guess, and share my beliefs. Yeah. Was there ever a time where you felt challenged in your faith? Something that was going to maybe hold you back or have to question about something? Um, not too much. I, I mean, my parents kind of raised me in a way that they trusted me, and that kind of made me trust myself more in things. And the other thing is they always told me to make the decision – before you have to make the decision, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right, so like, be prepared for, in case the situation even arises. Yeah. Yeah. And so it wasn't too hard for me. There are there still the occasion. But, you know, I'm not quite perfect. No, yeah, no one is. So, Riley, then... You've obviously noticed differences between Utah and California growing up as members of the church. Um, what's like a, an example of a good difference and a bad difference between what you saw, how you grew up in California versus how members grow up here? I don't know if you've talked with people about that, but just some good and bad differences. Well, I think good differences were like, I feel like I kind of got to know the world better in California. Like I got to know people of so many different religions and backgrounds and all that. Where here, it's mostly members of the church. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's a bad thing here. I think it helps people be strong here too. But I also feel like I definitely became stronger in the church because I grew up in California and had to test myself early in life. And so the one thing that I would say, at least judging off of my cousins, I have cousins that grew up in Utah, and, and it seems like a couple of them went through the stage of like, I want to be different and so like they didn't do the best stuff if you're if you're talking considering the church and so mm -hmm. I don't know if that's it's basing a lot off of a little but but I definitely think it helped me to grow up in California where everyone's diverse I could you know kind of get the whole I guess yeah. yeah. So with that being a part of your lifestyle, you are someone who really enjoys sharing the gospel. I know you've mentioned before that if you could have stayed on your mission forever, that's something you would you wouldn't mind doing. Oh yeah. Even with this hair. <laughs> yeah. Just keep it growing. I would uh <laughs> I would open the door to that hair. Absolutely. 
<laughs> but like what gives you that that drive i guess to share what you know i don't know i i feel like i've maybe i've talked about this to jesse but i i usually bring this up when talking about mission i feel like when you felt true repentance that makes you want to share the gospel that much and w when you felt that change like alma the younger type of change like i mean not all of us do that you know we're not that opposite but like when you when you felt forgiveness and when you felt like you're coming closer to the savior there's no greater feeling and you know preach my gospel talks about how the closer we come to christ and the more we understand his atonement the more we want to share it and i think that's my biggest drive is understanding atonement gotcha so you just kind of share that that core message above anything else right it's not necessarily oh you need to be in my church because this is where you have to be it's i love the savior and i've seen it and i want you to feel that same spirit as well yeah nice like considering missions like because what jesse just said is a, like an important differentiation i guess between being like a full-time missionary and then sharing the message of repentance and atonement right so like as far as that's considered like what were the things that you absolutely loved about the mission field and like the work and the way that you lived your life versus um, maybe some things that were less desirable i know that everybody has those things that they were like like i mean for me real quick example i loved living the gospel 100 percent every day like that like my life just felt so much better being in 100 percent full torque missionary mode you know but like didn't love waking up at 6 a.m every day i'm not gonna lie so that's kind of what i'm curious about your thoughts yeah i mean for me waking up wasn't that bad like i i i'm with you where i loved living the gospel every day I think that's why waking up was easier. Like I, I woke up before my commands so that I could read the scriptures more. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I found out later that that's also kind of against the you're supposed to stay in bed until your commands out of bed. But um, yeah, I think the hardest thing about a mission for me was not wearing shorts. <laughs> my mission true. is so hot all year round where were you at again remind me uh i was in peru in the desert okay. in peru the city that's right it's called piura which is the city of eternal <laughs> so yeah i i honestly think if i could have worn shorts every day i would have zero complaints <laughs> you know because like thinking eternally you think about miracles and all this stuff, all this stuff we see as, you know, miracles like Jesus healing the sick, making the blind see, parting, parting the waters, everything like that. But the biggest miracle we can see is someone in their heart because that's, that affects their eternity, not just their mortal life. And thinking about that, it, one, it makes any trials a lot easier. You know, it's, that's with any trial, even out of a mission. When you have an eternal perspective, it, it's so much easier. It doesn't take away your trials, but it makes them a little less yeah. than you could otherwise. All right. Like for me, the easiest days on the mission were the times that I completely forgot about my own stuff. I was worried about other people and worried about bringing a message and understanding that it doesn't matter how eloquent I am. It doesn't matter like necessarily how I say it. 
But if I'm bringing a true message to somebody and it touches their heart, it's the spirit talking to them and they're creating their connection um, with Christ and with God the Father. And I'm just a witness. I'm just a helper. It's not me doing the changing, right? But there definitely were some tough days. Winter in Philly was the, the coldest I've ever been. Just outside all day and negative 15 degree wind chill. But man. Yeah. I I definitely would have died in that winter. Right after. Yeah, I was glad to I was glad to serve my mission in, in Mexico where it was like I, I was in cent- central Mexico, so it was like seventy degrees year round. <laughs> it was nice. Good weather. I got lucky. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, yeah. It was just I didn't realize how big of a difference shade made until I got to my mid. <laughs> yeah. I learned that in Rome. In Rome, you have to find shade or it's hot all the time. Yeah. But I feel like the missions really are selected for us. Like, every once in a while, you have something happen where, like, a lot of people aren't able to go to their missions due to visas or to COVID restricting travel. But you still find people that you were meant to be in contact with. And there are people in Philly that I try to keep in contact with. Sometimes it's not as good, but like they changed my lives, you know, as much as I've tried to help them with theirs, right? And yeah. there's something special about the the process, how they select where missionaries go. You know, just like looking at a map and having a prompting and you know, it takes them so fast down to like the exact mission where they should go. That's something I'd want to like witness firsthand if I ever get the chance. Yeah, for, I w- I would love to see it. That I I feel like a lot of the here, like people missionaries say oh, I would not want to go to a place like this. You know, I don't want to go anywhere hot. And then and to Africa, you know, all of a sudden they see why they were sent there. I think that's something comfort God knows us better than we know ourselves and that's why we can be sent to places that's why we can go through certain things that that we wouldn't necessarily want but we see after you kind of cut out after afterwards for me there oh I just after afterwards we can see that experience gotcha yeah like for me i wanted to go i i wanted to go to africa and i either that or i wanted to learn a different language that wasn't spanish (laughs) and i learned spanish but i'm so glad i learned spanish and i basically got sent to africa spanish so So, um, this is like a question about continuing the missionary experience. Um, I guess my question would be, what has been, since you've been home, uh, it's been two years now for you? Yep. Yeah, so so since you've been home, um, our mission president was very fixated on saying never an ex missionary, just a returned missionary. And, you know, you continue that being that level of person of a missionary where you live the gospel. And when you have the chance to share it, you share it. And, you know, you're still like, you extend your missionary service, but you're just no longer a full time missionary. So have you been able to find anything like that that's worked for you to continue sharing the gospel in here in Utah? Like, I mean, it's been hard for me, especially like I always am trying to think of ways that I can share the gospel, but I really, I mean, I live in Logan, Utah, so I don't see that many opportunities, but I know that everybody has their own way of trying to share it. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that or if you've been able to do anything in this, in the time since you've been back. Yeah. I mean, for for the four semesters that I've been, I guess I've been, yeah, 
semesters. For the, for each semester, my goal was to give away a book a semester, and I've I've done that. That's and awesome. It's honestly just through like small things, like just getting to know someone, or the, I mean, the first Book of Mormon I gave away, and I passed the reference on to the missionaries was a guy that was shoveling huge driveway up this and I would, I was just walking past I was like you want help and he was like oh, no I got it and I was like alright I'll go grab a shovel and I'd like <laughs> walk down to my house and went back up and he was like wow thanks and then I found out he was I feel like it's it's easier when you've kind of got on their good side yeah I don't know. I think the harder part for me is getting on their good side. <laughs> I, I doubt you have a problem with that. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're charismatic. You got it down. You're fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I. Go ahead. I just you think go ahead. little things that honestly make a big difference. Mm. Yeah. A lot of people will just, you'll find out without even having to ask. Mm hmm. If they have religion like that, and I think I think that's one skill. I guess I've learned I learned on my mission is like a lot of times people will come to you after you know gotten to know them enough and mm -hmm. gotten comfortable. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. That's like I mean I've been trying in my own way to do things like this, but um, one one kid that was in my classes with me, actually, I got talking to him, and in, his name was Muhammad. He's from Saudi Arabia. We just started talking a lot, got to know each other, and it was a good time. We became closer and closer friends because we were in a lot of the same courses together, studying a lot of the same things, so we would work with each other. And same concept. After a while, you know, we got talking about religion and things like that, and I told him what I believed in, and he's like, oh, yeah, I've heard there's a lot of members of the church around here in, in Utah. And I'm like, there's a lot. Most of your classmates are. I guarantee it. <laughs> and um, and he was just curious. We got talking about what what we believed in individually, you know. And he, he helped me learn Arabic a little bit. I've been trying to do that with Jesse for a time, too, trying to learn a little bit of that. And anyways, I ended up giving him a Book of Mormon, and I tried to write my testimony in Arabic in the Book of Mormon. I did, like, my best effort, and man, <laughs> he laughed about it after. He was like, you know, I appreciate the, the effort, the thought, but your, your Arabic's pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> off. <laughs> and I was like, eh, it was worth a shot, you know? But uh, I agree. It's, like, it's easier to share the gospel once they confide in you, once they trust you as a person, as a friend, so... Well, let's move on to um, a really fun topic. You are borderline obsessed <laughs> with some uh, some animals, cheetahs. Oh yeah. Is this is this part of why you wanted to serve your mission in Africa? Um. Yeah, part of it. <laughs> I always wanted. See a bunch of those animals that are from Africa. And what what got you started on cheetahs? I, f I forget. Was it like a school project you did, or just like seeing them on Animal Planet? Uh, no, it was just I really love learning about animals and their unique talents. Like any land animal that can run 75 miles an hour is pretty impressive to me. Very that's, impressive. That's fair, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they can only run 75 miles an hour for, I don't know, a minute before their brain explodes and they die. So, I mean, <laughs> but just thinking about the fact that animals can do stuff like that, like rhinos and hippos both can run 40 miles an hour and us humans are here that couldn't we can only run like 27 if that's usain bolt or whatever 
Yeah. Well, put yeah, me in that Bugatti. I'll hit two fifty real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And so I just, I like things like that. Like, and I can, I can go on and on about Cheetah's talent, why they run so fast. I mean, they can get from zero to 60 in three seconds, which is also three strides. Wow. It takes a whole second to, me, to do a stride. Like, yeah. Isn't that crazy? They, they're pretty slow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So why, why, I guess I should ask this first, because I don't know if this is even actually fact. Is the cheetah your favorite animal? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Is that the animal you would choose to take in a fight against another animal? Depends on what animal I'm fighting. Because I got, I got two in my, in my corner. Uh, I got, I got a... <laughs> I've Go got it, I've got a Komodo dragon and a bald eagle in my corner, so that's those are my two fighters for you. Yeah, and then I, I I would have a cheetah as one of them, and the other, I mean, my favorite animal growing up was a rhino. No way, that's <laughs> on my list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like my like you know how you have those first emails that are like <laughs> unique to little people. Rhino my, lover my four. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was Rai Rhino. Rai Rhino. Ah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. That's a, sorry, real, this is going to be a real quick interjection here. So for my two, I have a rhino and a grizzly bear. Um, but I wanted to say on the rhino, and this is actually one of the most wild stories that happened to me, so I'm going to condense this as quickly as I can. I had a buddy that his dad was a chief in an American Indian tribe, and he was also their spiritual leader. And so he, um, he, his dad came and did a spiritual session with us, and we found our spirit animals through like this story, and it was really cool. It was a really interesting experience that I could share on a later date. But um, anyways, we did this whole journey. And we got our spirit animals, and mine was a rhino. And so, yes, rhino is one of my favorite animals as well. And it's one that I would choose in a, in a fight against most animals. I think you That's pretty win. fair. Thank yeah, you. I mean, you definitely have two that their senses are a little hindered. Like bears. Actually, yeah. bears and rhinos both. Bears use their smell mostly. Their eyes mm -hmm. kind of suck. And rhinos' eyes kind of suck, too. Yeah. But rhinos use their sight or their hearing. Mm -hmm. One second. I mean, yeah, that's I know the bear thing because you know, that's that's what they say. If you ever come across a bear that's trying to fight you, punch him in the nose or something, and they'll they'll kind of lose. Yeah, you'd be able to get away faster. But rhinos, yeah. you can't really punch them in both ears. <laughs> Yeah, we. Uh, I learned about that with. Sorry, I was, real quick. I we learned about that with bear spray as well. Um, if, if you have bear spray and there's a bear coming after you, don't spray it at the bear. <laughs> spray it on the ground and run, because they'll chase after you with their head on the ground, sniffing your trail, and then they'll smell the pepper spray and they won't be able to chase you down anymore. So, fun fact. <laughs> Can't do that to an eagle though. <laughs> you're right <laughs> you got a point take a take a peregrine falcon against an eagle <laughs> I, I don't know if it can fly as high though it can fly faster well they can oh yeah for sure that's the fastest animal in the world there's a I don't know if it's a body but it's one of the eagles these uh crows these ravens will try to get on top of them and like chew at their neck but the eagle doesn't do anything; just keeps flying higher and higher until the other bird can't breathe anymore. Oh my god! Just yeah, just, wow. yeah, pretty awesome. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> so they just they just carry the bird up up to the clouds, and let the bird just kind of die on its own. Yeah, it's like, while it's yeah. chewing on its neck. I got nothing nothing better to do. Just take it up <laughs> higher. 
a la Iron Man one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Komodo dragons, about three hundred pounds, can run as fast as a dog. One bite, <laughs> one bite gets you with all the bacteria in their mouth. <laughs> Plus, they're an endangered species, so they're really cool too. Yeah, and I think that's why I like animals so much. Is there's something unique about every animal that make extreme value. And I think yes. that's kind of how we are too, but not as good. <laughs> Scaled back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that leaves Is you. There... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Jesse. You're fine. You go. I'm I'm changing the subject, so if you want to go. Okay, real quick, man. It, it's just a final question. Then, have you then considered? Because I know for a while when I had talked to you, like a, I don't know, a couple months ago. You were doing like kinesiology, body, health, body stuff. And so has studying animals like a zoology type thing been an interest of yours, like something that you want to do later on in your life or just concurrently with your life, like always look into and study more about animals? That's Yeah, I mean, I've never really thought to do zoology or anything like that, but I... I mean, I haven't really experienced, I haven't really met a whole lot of other animals besides dogs. Mm -hmm. And I love dogs. I rode a horse once. That was cool. <laughs> That's but pretty cool. I, I just feel like there's stuff that we can learn. Oh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. There I am. Yeah. Um, I just feel like there's things we can learn from anything we can see in the world there's a lot we can learn from animals and i think the first thing that kind of sparked my interest was just watching youtube videos about about animals that like that have just randomly protected humans or animals that just show love to any other movie and I think that's what kind of interested me in animals in the first place is they all have that. I, I mean, it's kind of weird to say Christ-like love, but it seems like they all think about the rest of the animals around them too. Mm -hmm. If you've ever just, you know, and I'm, I'm not talking cheetahs attacking gazelles or anything like that i mean that's not really a christ-like love but you know you see you see how they treat other animals that they're not eating it's kind of a weird comparison but yeah and and the other thing is if i could choose any superpower it would be super speed for sure like dash would be my go-to super superhero <laughs> there you go not not flash dash dash he's still a little kid i mean you just be not superman he can do it all so yeah you know uh mosiah 319 talks about being as a child so i have to stay dash instead of flash what about, there you go. What about sense. kid flash <laughs> nope oh, okay. it doesn't work yeah and so that i kind of studied cheetahs like seeing like I wonder if there's things that they do that we that we could do to run fast. Mm -hmm. Not really. We run a completely different way. <laughs> I've already I've already tried. <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining Riley on all fours across the rugby field. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, but unfortunately, we as humans are not perfect. And that's something you want to kind of go into where, you know, we all have these imperfections in our lives. We all make mistakes. And we can't really judge a person based on their lack of perfection. So why was that something that interested you as a discussion topic? Well, I think for me, that's kind of the biggest thing showing up in the world right now 
as imperfections. I think our natural instinct as humans is to find someone's imperfections and only see them as that. And I, I will always say we will always see what we want. And so if all we want to see is, you know, for example, this, all this racist stuff going on, like if, if all we want to do is see the world as a racist, we'll only see racist because we'll only be focused on that. But if we see, if we want to see everyone loving everyone, we'll also see that too. And I mean, there's definitely a balance, like, you can't just be oblivious and expect that everyone loves everyone, but I definitely think if if the world could look at people in a positive way and and you know just focus on the positive things, I think a lot of problems would be solved that way. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that, I mean, that's, and like, all of what you just said is, it keeps bringing to my mind right now, at least, this topic that I see fairly frequently on Twitter and other areas like that, other social medias, of cancel culture, where it's all about canceling someone because they find something that they've done wrong in the past. And um, I think that that goes along with what you're saying is it's like, you can find imperfections in everyone and then that cancel culture is like, oh, we found something wrong that this person did five years ago. Forget about them forever. You know, get rid of them. They're not allowed to ever have happiness again. And it's like, well, what's the point? Like, isn't that the whole point of life to make mistakes and learn and grow? And so, I don't know. I just kind of like that was coming to my mind as you were talking about, about these imperfections and the way that we see the world. And I think a lot of people choose to see the world angry and they choose to see the world as all the problems that there are instead of looking for all the times people have been trying to change and to grow. So I don't really have a question, actually, but that was what was on my mind as you were talking there was just cancel culture as a whole and how it really does ruin the chance for people to grow and change and become better, you know? Yeah, and that even applies to yeah. people who didn't necessarily even commit the the error. They just like were accused of it and they are seen as that person for the rest of their lives as well. Like I think of like Michael Jackson. I think he technically was found innocent of all this stuff, but everyone thinks he did those things with those kids. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's crazy that something like that can so fast be believed by everyone. Like even something that is completely not true, it can spread fast. Half the people that hear it will. I mean, there. I don't know if I can um, exit out and find a quote, but. There's uh, one of the books I read recently, not recent, it's been a while, but it's it's a book about the atonement. It basically says if we fail to forgive other people, we're basically saying the atonement wasn't perfect and that Jesus, you know, he performed a flawed atonement. And that he needs to repent for that. So when we don't forgive other people, or when we see, when we judge someone by one bad thing they did, we're basically judging Christ and his atonement. And that's something that has stuck with me, is knowing that I'm failing as a friend and brother of Christ, that you know, I'm I'm failing to represent him 
to show you know to show people that he really did what he did yeah like <clears throat> I, I and i agree with that i think that that's um a good way of looking at it you know to keep yourself in check because <laughs> that's those are some hard accusations if you won't if you won't forgive someone and you realize that you're really calling christ's atonement flawed that's that's large accusations to make so um, important forgiveness is important, but um, like, I guess my question would be, um, what is the best way to overcome those imperfections that you've seen in your life? Like the best way to overcome those imperfections that we have and grow. Um, just anything that you found useful in your life, you know, things that you know maybe I or another viewer could implement. Well, I mean, for me, the biggest thing, at least for seeing the positive in people or, or you know, understanding better and not getting for something that they do that you don't like is getting to know them. I mean, you can't ever judge someone personally that you don't know personally. And so it's kind of the same. Don't ever take something personally that someone says about you that they don't know you personally. If you get to know people, if you get to know, you know, whoever and you're, you're mad at them for doing whatever they did and you get to know them better, you start to understand why they did it and why, why it's not as bad to them as it seems to you. And it, I feel like that makes it a lot easier to see positive in people is when you get to know people better. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the other thing is just, honestly, the small and simple things make a difference. I, I said this at the beginning, but when you have an eternal perspective, it makes problems seem less. You know, there's always that philosophy that you know, if it's if something's bothering you and you're not going to be mad in 24 hours, then why waste your time staying mad? Yeah. You know, if you if you go to bed and then you wake up and you're not mad anymore, then there's really no point in being mad in the first place. Yeah, I think something that's big is seeing the potential in people as well. It can be difficult to imagine someone being, you know, some like goddess or god but you know you start with seeing them as a potential friend you know you don't know what they've been through you don't know how you'll get along until you make that first impression that first contact and everyone wants to start off on a good foot rather than you know tearing someone down at the beginning and oh hey let's be friends now so yeah, yeah, I, sorry, real quick, I going along with that, I think that um, this has kind of come full circle, and it's kind of cool, because Riley started off, started off by talking about um, the current world that we're living in, about racism and things like that, and what you just said reminded me of what Elder Ballard said in this last conference, I mean, his whole talk was focused around this, about seeing everyone as our brothers and sisters, because that's what they are. You know, I mean, and even if you don't believe in deity, even if you don't believe in the religion we believe in, they're still brothers and sisters as far as the human race goes. And so, like, why be rude in that aspect? But even more so, if you can see them as brothers and sisters of our Heavenly Father, their Heavenly Father's children, then you can see that potential that you're talking about, Jesse, and you can treat them as the potential that they can become. And especially even more so as a brother and sister to you personally. And you can treat them, you know, as everyone wants to be treated. So I like how it's come full circle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I know Jesse took this class too. I took a class called Perspectives on Race. <laughs> I don't really want to bring it up as a race thing, but it basically talks about how 
humans are not that different from each other. Like we're probably the most, one of the most similar species on earth, you know, between two fruit flies or two penguins that look exactly the same. There are way more genetic differences than there are between me and, you know, someone from Asia or Africa or, or Russia, you know, we were way more similar than most others, but we naturally just kind of see different in people instead of focusing on the similarity. And I think that's what, that's kind of what makes problem appear is, you know, not, you can, you can, we can talk about like po seeing the positives in people and this basically is the same thing, but you know, when we see similarities, that's, that's where we can get along better. But right when you start focusing on, oh, this person's different, that's, that's when you get, you know, more distanced, I guess. Mm -hmm. And Christ taught so often about, you know, worrying about what's on the inside rather than what's on the outside. Stop worrying about all the outward practices as much, as long as getting your heart in the right spot. You know, you need to put in your heart to love everyone, regardless of how they treat you. Sometimes you need to treat people who treat you poorly better than those who treat you nicely. And start with yourself and let that grow outward rather than starting with the outside of the cup, cleaning that off, and then you still get dirt in your water. Yeah, I mean, in, in touching on that, I mean, we can actually use that as a transition right there if we're done with this topic. Um, but we can start going back to the, uh, well, back to Jesse's recent blog post, um, Biblical Allegory. I'm not going to say that, Jesse. I will slaughter the Latin involved. So. <laughs> the Allegory is Bibliae? That wasn't too tough. Eh, still, don't want, don't want any Latin... <laughs> buffs coming after me in the comments so hey, but anyways there'll be lots of them one day <laughs> there will be eventually but um yeah getting out of this biblical allegory where jesse was talking about christ and his teachings that was one of his favorite ways to teach was through allegory and um he taught when he was in person in the new testament he taught so much through allegory through descriptions of events and so that's why Jesse's blog post has a little bit to do about biblical allegory versus in the Old Testament, whether it was allegorical, the stories, or if they were physical, real life stories. Um, so, uh, Riley, do you have any thoughts in general on that topic about if the if the Old Testament was written literally physical events that happened or if it was allegorical? Um, also, if you read the post, you can talk a little bit about things that you liked in there, just open question. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, I never really thought of, thought of it like that, like, like what the post is talking about, but I have kind of seen that everything is, uh, is the right word, but, uh, a microcosm you know everything is you know uh, some kind of representation of Christ you might say a shadow or a type yeah yeah a type exactly Every, you know I've never really seen things as that until until my mission and then I started seeing biblical stories where I was like, wow, this is, this is literally a type of Christ. That's, that's kind of how I try and see the stories of the Old Testament is just, how is this a type of Christ? The crazy thing is when you, when you, when you see that, it's a lot easier to notice Christ in other things too. 
not just the scripture. I think that's really cool. So, like, taking the scriptures, focusing yourself on Christ, and then turning that into looking at the rest of the world, and just, like, your daily life, and focusing on Christ there as well is, is kind of what you're saying, right? Yeah. I like that. Um, one of the main reasons I wrote about this is because I've seen it as, like, a growing... Um, I don't know, like phenomenon that has happened before. This isn't like the first time people have touted the Bible off as purely allegorical and not based in reality, but used as like a tool to either organize the Hebrew people with the Ten Commandments and the Exodus of of Moses to using it to unify Israel and Judah with the stories of David and King Solomon and back when like the whole kingdom was united, right? So there's definitely reasons for people to to view it that way. But I've tried to view it that way and I just don't necessarily see the point. I feel like there's much more value in the Bible if these events did at least in some respect, occur historically as well. Like one thing that sticks out to me is that it's like 98% to 100% of all civilizations have some kind of flood myth. And just coincidentally do people all worry about floods. I know it was very common for agriculture back in, you know, 5,000 years ago. But the fact that all humanity would have spread from Noah in the flood strikes me as much more believable to me that it would be more spread, more widespread that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I and I agree with what you're saying. I. There are points in the in the Bible where it is taught through allegory, I think, but I think the majority of it is historical because, I mean, like, you can find similar writings in the Quran and you can find similar teachings. And, I, and I'm not just saying, like, the teachings. I'm saying, like, very similar stories where they talk about um, similar occurrences happening. And so it's, you know, it, it's a little too small for me to say, yeah, it's a, it was allegorical. And somehow we all shared the same concept teachings in the same way. You know, I do think that there's a large basis of uh, literal history to it. Um, I think that it was written in a way that was poetic also. So it can kind of change the way that we, that we read it, that we view it. But the stories are, I, I would believe that most of the stories are true um, in that respect. Um, Riley, did you read this blog post? Just curious. No, I I read the first little bit and, you know, distraction about. <laughs> that's that's what always happens. No worries. I was just curious if there was anything in, in the section that you wanted to talk about specifically. Um in this blog post, but um, if not, that's fine. I would just say then, um, I, I really liked what you were saying about how you look at it as a as how we can see Christ in all of the teachings. Um, I'm curious though, what um, aspects of the Bible you would say, just thinking about it personally, if any, are allegorical versus physical, literal history. If you could, if you do think of any, I don't I mean, this is kind of an overall opinion, not mm -hmm. of any specific story, but I, I feel like 
almost everything, if not every, is historical. But in each individual story, you know, maybe there, maybe there are some things that are thrown in there so that we understand it better. That may not have necessarily happened, but the overall story is real. Mm -mm. I don't know if that makes. Sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Like and so one maybe, of them, maybe. Go, ahead. go for it. No, you, you. Go ahead. Well, I was, I was just gonna say maybe, maybe little details are thrown in there to help us think a certain way or help us see the bigger picture, not just the straight up historical, you know, events, but also the reasons and, you know, the whys and the, not necessarily the what's, but how can we learn from it? You know, and I think that's, it's the same in any book of scripture that we're talking about is we, it's in there so that we don't have to, you know, go through the exact same thing. So that if we study the scriptures, we can learn that stuff without having to go through it. <laughs> and that I'm kind of paraphrasing one of the apostles was talking about specifically Doctrine and Covenants 21, 121 through 123 with Joseph Smith and his struggles and how it's written in and recorded so that we can learn it without necessarily having to go through it, if that makes sense. And I think a lot of history, you know, a lot of a lot of the biblical stories have that meaning that maybe they've thrown in details that kind of help us see that meaning. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I, I would absolutely agree on that. Um, I was just going to bring up a specific story that we could talk about unless there's something that you wanted to ask about jesse that's not quite delving into a specific story oh you're fine okay um because i was this is one that i thought about a lot and i um i've got my own thoughts on it but i would love to hear what you guys think about it as well just the story of adam and eve i mean we we learn a lot about it obviously um both in the scriptures and um in other places that we learn about the scriptures and with Adam and Eve specifically, I'm curious how much of that story do you guys think is physical versus allegorical? Um, I guess like what would be the purpose of that being an allegorical story? Um, I'm just curious on that one specifically. That one's kind of hard. I'm I've I took anatomy last semester, and <laughs> our anatomy teacher talked a lot about what the Hebrew word to sell, I think it is, of a rib. Mm -hmm. And I I also read a book called Echoes of Eden that talks about Adam and Eve and all of the things that are symbols, and it made me think about. You know what if if it was meant to be taken literally or if it's something that that we need to see the symbolism of um, so I guess to start the the word rib in Hebrew can mean two two or three different parts of the body and but we see the rib as, you know, God used Adam's rib to show that the woman isn't behind us or in front of us, but right to our side as our companion walking next to us. Or making love in the backseat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but next to each other. Yeah. <laughs> and, and 
you know, another symbol of that could be that the rib is the closest bone to the heart and that that could be symbolic of like a woman are meant to be that close and are meant to love like that and that's why it's so close to the heart but I just kind of went out on a tangent there that really didn't have to do with your question Zach no, you're good. but I, I do think a lot of that story that I had always taken literally there are so many symbols and different meanings that that I hadn't really thought of you know this is just symbolic versus this is actually a literal meaning yeah yeah and I and I see Jesse that you brought yours up on on this topic I um we can talk about this as well I I was talking specifically I guess in regards to their their creation um because a lot of people will say yes physically boom god made man with adam there and then they made eve right after that and that's that you know or there are i mean i'm then this is why i'm curious because i'm i'm still figuring it out you know i mean as i've studied biology and um, physiology and things like that we learned that there is such thing as evolution um from a scientific side so is it like there was an evolution up until a point when God was like, okay, now man has come to the point where a spirit can inhabit the body, and there we go. You know, there's man. Or was it literally God and Adam came down and they were like, boom, here's man, let's go ahead and start this life. I have a couple issues with that. I, I recognize that evolution can be seen. I don't know all the ways in they, they could have been created. One thing that I do recognize is that everything was created spiritually first and then physically. So to say that they evolved and then the spirit was put in afterward kind of implies that the animals before that had to die to get there didn't have spirits and aren't part of the same process. The biggest thing for me is that they had to exist in such a way that they were able to fall. Like they couldn't have been created imperfectly, imperfectly. Because God cannot create something imperfect lest he also be imperfect, right? So they are created in some kind of perfect form. And whether or not they actually eat a physical fruit to fall they trespass a commandment in some way that cuts them off from the presence of God and introduces death to humankind. I don't know necessarily if there was death in the garden at all or if it was just them that were immortal in the garden. That's a little harder for me to decipher from what I've understood. But there's some, there's some change that must have happened between the creation of man and the fall. Because if there's no fall, then there's no atonement. And if there's no atonement, there's no hope to return with God. Or if there was no fall and they were just imperfect from the beginning, we have no hope to be with a God that can't create perfect things, right? So that's why I have a hesitation to say that there wasn't an Adam and Eve that had to fall it's such a key part of the whole plan well no they definitely had to fall the question was if there was an evolution up to that point and and i think i see where you're coming from with the there would have had to have been a spirit to inhabit that body beforehand so i see that issue but i mean either way they would have had to have fallen and that would have been the creation moment they would have been created perfectly um but yeah it is just a curious question. I don't know. I've been pondering on it, on how literal that creation would be. Riley, do you have any thoughts? I mean, I've 
I've had a lot of different thoughts about evolution. You know, I, right when I got home, my biology class was half the semester was straight up evolution. And our teacher, our teacher basically said, we're going to go into great detail on this and you have to memorize all of it because it's our world history. And I was like, and then I started thinking about it and I'm like, it could be possible, but I have yet to really, you know, see how, how it could have led up to Adam and Eve. And I, I honestly don't, I think. I think the bodies of Adam and Eve were definitely created and and that mm, I don't know that's that's a tough one yeah. I you know I've I've had that on my mind a lot because I was I was telling I was complaining about my class that, well it could be Yeah, and that's and that, 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 sorry. Yeah, like that's just like the the point of it. You know, it's a thought process. It's a it's a fun thought exercise to do and just kind of think about. Obviously, the the whole point is that does this matter for our salvation or exaltation? No. <laughs> it's fun to speculate. It's fun to think about. What matters is how we live the gospel and how we commit to becoming better. Um, but it's just kind of fun to, to go through these thought processes and kind of see um, what everyone thinks about things like this. You know, it's it's fun. It, it makes it entertaining. So, for sure. And you know, just learning to become familiar with the spirit, so that you're able to discern these things as they come to you. You may not get um, to the same place everyone else does, but you know it's it's practice. It's getting better at it and, and learning the the language of the spirit. But we are going to move on now to everyone's favorite segment, diamonds in the rough. Are you ready for this, Riley? We are going to read a quote. And then we're going to talk about the quote, and then we will reveal who the speaker was or writer. All right. If one night you see someone committing a sin, tomorrow do not look at her as a sinner. She may have repented during the night, and you did not know. Now I'll read it one more time for you. If one night you see someone committing a sin... Tomorrow, do not look at her as a sinner. She may have repented during the night, and you did not know. What does that make you I feel? Think I think that's a great quote for what we talked about today. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. It makes me think of, like, you never really know what's through that's why we shouldn't be so judged maybe it's that they're they've slowly been changing and they're getting better but he said a lot harder look at that and bring it up to them and uh, it makes you wonder i'm curious <clears throat> this is this this can go full circle all the way, the whole podcast, back to the beginning. We talked about missionary life, bringing people to the atonement, right? And then we talked about forgiveness and, and um, repentance and imperfections and whatnot. So bringing it full circle, based on this quote that Jesse just read us, if you are in the missionary mindset of sharing the atonement and helping people repent and become, you know, meet Christ again, and you see someone sinning in the night, do you be a missionary? Do you invite them to repent? Or do you just 
let it go because maybe they already repented, you know? I think that if you're a missionary, you probably do that. But as a person that's just a normal person, you just let it go and you just love them, right? That's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, and I, I, I honestly think being an example will help them more than judging. I, I, I think you can be a missionary without necessarily doing the missionary trying to convert them we have a quote on our fridge that says always live your life in such a way that those who don't know Christ will want to know Christ with I think that that helps a lot just you know be someone who's loving that that can sometimes help be typical problem solving things normally to help yeah yeah you never know what someone's going through you don't know what they're doing behind the scenes you get such a small glimpse of what people are like and even if you feel like they might be doing something behind your back give them the benefit of the doubt uh, most of the time it'll be worth it obviously you don't stay in Toxic relationships more than you have to, but letting people the opportunity to repent goes far and beyond what you can do just by saying, "Hey, you did that wrong. Go fix it." I was like, "Get you don't know if they already did or not," and their their timeline on the plan of salvation is their timeline. It's not yours. They don't have to repent on your time. It's how they can get to it. And whatever you can do to be helpful in that is that's a blessing. So what are some guesses as to the source of this quote? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um... The way it's written, it's not written with like modern day, at least modern day English writing. So it's either older or it's from a different language. And I don't know. <laughs> That's all I got for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm completely lost. I don't know. I feel like there are a lot of people that I've heard speak that say that I'm kind of at a loss right all right I'll let start. us know what is it let me type it up real quick so the person's name is Imam Ali Ibn Abi Talib all right so is that right where it's a different language it was originally written in Arabic Hey. This person is the um, cousin of Muhammad, the prophet, mm. and in Shia Islam was the successor. So, cool. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that it used she. I don't know if that was a, a blessing to like be less judgmental to women. Or if he's trying to say women commit sin more and repent more. Who knows? I wasn't there. But, yeah, again, not someone of our faith, but had something very profound to say that I find to be true. And I will accept that into my cache of truth that I've been collecting. All right, do you have any closing thoughts for us, Riley? I just, I mean, I really like the discussion, and I honestly, the allegories topic kind of got me. Yeah, go go read, and then talk to me later, too. Yeah, about a lot of different stories in the Bible, and, you know, it makes you think with a different perspective. 
for sure. Zachary, any closing thoughts for you? Um, no, I mean, I think that again, uh, the general consensus as we've gone through this again is that you can learn good things in a lot of different areas, like we saw again from another diamond in the rough. And as well, I would say Riley's whole segment on animals talking about how there are things that we can learn from each of them um, and just become better, you know, try and implement things that, that will make our lives better. Um, we talked about imperfections too. I think that it was just a really good topic to talk about a lot of good things on how to be a better person in general. So um, no closing thoughts other than those. I think it was a awesome. good, well-rounded segment everyone there is a youtube channel and those of you seen this are already here tell your friends about <laughs> it let them know hit the subscribe button we are climbing we're at eight subscribers already our goal is a thousand by the end of the time i'm doing this podcast <laughs> <laughs> i don't have deadlines so uh, i think one more takeaway is just a love I think that makes all these other problems. So, yeah. True. Just it in that. Christ-like love. For sure. Christ-like love. The best way to learn about it and the best way to achieve it is studying Christ. All right. With that being said, eat more, more chicken. chicken. <laughs> <laughs> we need to... Uh, we need to alternate those next time we need one uh, two eat, three or something uh, all right we'll, we'll keep practicing we'll we'll tag we'll, the, get it, we'll, get we'll tag chick-fil-a again <laughs> see if they'll reach out maybe i'll send them a message being their biggest fan up here in logan so <laughs> it's a lesson all right thanks for thanks for watching